I have Rambam, so I'm going to lose. Um, you don't mind if I listen. I'm going to need some drink. I'm not why he's not answering you. Maybe uh, I don't know if he's having it today. Zoom, right? Yeah, I did Zoom. Hi. Hey, Lois. What's going on? Uh, not much. Hi, Lois. Hi, Estelle. How are you doing? I'm happy Purim to everybody. Yes. Very ah. Freilich and Purim. Do we know he's coming? <laughs> he didn't say anything. I know. I don't recall him saying anything. Come on. Hi. Excellent to see all your avatars. Good morning, uh, uh, Rabbi. Good, Good morning, Rabbi. Good morning. There Good you morning, are. Good morning, Lois. Good morning, Sam. And I uh, wish you a happy Purim this evening. Um, Purim. Yeah. So um, I got to bring up our Rambam class, the Rabbi Fox at Darche Noam gives a class on Shabbos morning. And we're doing the book of Shmuel. And somehow we got talking about the clothing of the Kohen. Um, and so I got to bring in our Rambam stuff. And it's specifically that um, idea of the Rambam that when, when a coin is not wearing his Kohen clothing, he doesn't have the status of a Kohen. He has the status of a czar, a stranger. So um, if a stranger does the service in the base of Mikdash, a non Kohen does the service in the base of Mikdash, they are liable to the death penalty. So too, a coin who is not wearing the prop, his proper clothing is liable to the death penalty. Why is he liable to the death penalty? Because he is not a coin when he doesn't, when he isn't wearing his clothing. This is such a deep idea. And it's and when we've looked at the various comments that he makes 
in the book of mitzvahs, they usually don't go this deep. I mean, obviously everything could be uh, a doorway to something deeper, but they're not as obviously deep as that was, because that really gets you to think about the, um, the existential nature of what it means to be a coin. Um, and, and so anyways, that was, had to bring that up. So I, I think the last one we did was um, was mitzvah 34, and that was the mitzvah for the Kohanim to carry the ark on their shoulders, uh, that and that it, it should be Kohanim. To, and he goes through quite a bit to talk about this, even though, um, again, like how, when is this ever going to come up? isn't the assumption that from now on there's just going to be a base of Mikdosh and the, the Ark is going to be placed in the base of Mikdosh and that's it. It's not going to be moved. You, you don't move it. So why would there be an act of command? Because when he does this list of 613 mitzvahs, these are at least in potential act of commands. That means they're not just things that were done in the past. They are things that are anticipated that will be done in the future. So I, you could imagine maybe that if they have to fashion an ark somewhere or they find the ark somewhere, they have to bring it to the Beit HaMikdash, but that's a one-time thing. It's not like, uh, so it's, it's, sort of, it's just sort of interesting that he lists this as one of the 613. And then we looked at the Ramban and, and the commentary said the Ramban, Nachmanides also agrees that this, that this mitzvah, he has some disagreement about the details, but he agrees that this is a mitzvah for all generations. So it's sort of interesting that it would be because the rest of the mitzvahs, or like, for instance, from this week's Torah portion, there's all sorts of mitzvahs that apply to the inauguration of the Mishkan. They are not listed in the 613 mitzvahs because they happened once. That's all there. We're not the plan is not to do them. If we have an inauguration of the third base of Mikdash, it's going to have its own rules. There's no assumption that they're, you're just going to apply uh, the same de uh, the same rules that happened before. Um, how they broke down the camp, which families of Levine carried what, um, those kind of things are not listed in the 613 because they only happened once. So it's just sort of funny that one of these mitzvahs was taken up by a mitzvah like this, which maybe, maybe it, it should happen one time for a few minutes. And that's uh, it. Rabbi, up. sorry, the, yeah. the mitzvah is to make the holders or to make the poles, which, no. which what, what no, is No, this is that the, the coin, he commanded the priest to carry the ark on their shoulders. Oh, that's it. And move that's it. But not the formation of the art, the, but the but no. the myth of caring. Okay. I am. Yeah. Caring. Under what circumstance? I I, am, I I I was told that one uh, Hasidic explanation of it is that it's the nature of Torah to go forth, just like the menorah goes outward. So Torah has to go outward too, and it has to constantly be. This is some sort of. Hasidic idea. Right, no, but I, 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 I love that. But you also have Hasidic ideas about what they did in the Mishkan. 
Now there's, but you wouldn't list them as one of the 613 mitzvahs. I, of course, I, I am certain that every detail, even of the stuff that was done in the time of the Mishkan has a lesson for all generations. Right. But, 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 but that is practically, and also, and we did see last time that even the Ramban says that this is a mitzvah for, um, for all generations. Oh, by the way, one thing, the thing about the poles being in the uh, Aaron, that yeah. is not listed as a positive commandment, but the Rambam does list it under the negative commandment. As a negative, right, not take them out. You're not allowed to take them out. Right, you're not allowed to take them out. Um, okay, yeah, we looked for it last time to see if it was listed as positive commandments. Thank you, thank you for that. All right, um, okay, now, well, I am sorry, a little distant and with my phone. Um, you said you can't take them out where? So the poles, the, once the poles are inserted into the rings of the ark, uh -huh. even though, even though the ark, oh. this came up last time because when I when I mentioned my surprise that this mitzvah is included last time, David made the point that by design, this ark has poles, which means that it's intended to be moved. And, uh, and uh, so, Thanks. yeah, obviously, and I, uh, yeah, there's something about this. There's a, there's a mystery here that is, that is a, it's a good one. It's a good one. It's a good mystery because that is, and, and so, and now, now Dave was just pointing out that, um, that those poles being there matter. They, they matter. You're not allowed to remove the poles. So it has to be, so there's something about the art. Ever? That, ever? Yeah. You're not supposed to take out the poles ever. You're supposed to keep them there. So when they're in the Holy of Holies, that box is there with the rings and the poles through the rings, which means that that ark is, it's by design, looks like something to be moved. Why is that? Why is it on the move? So you're giving the Hasidic approach, which is that Torah needs to be outside. Torah can't just sit inside it moves outside as a reminder perhaps that it was moved and that it and then the symbolic of it being moved out yeah yeah i think i think it's there until the building of the final temple then it'll be then moved to the final gonna... temple then the commandment will be to remove them Right, point. but that you have a that's a separate thing, which is will there be different commandments at some point, or will it because in several places the, the Torah says uh, you cannot add to these, you can't subtract to these forever. So the, there is a question as to is it possible that there will be mitzvahs that are done differently or apply differently? Like for instance, there's there's a teaching that um in the future, we will not celebrate the other holidays except for Purim. Is that right? What is that teaching? How do you guys pass over? Yeah, one second here. Rabbi, did you hear what I said? What did you say? I'm, I'm, I'm mute. I, I was just mute. saying, I would have thought it was Passover, the one that would be the only one. Yeah. No? So, right. So, um, let's see here. Our sages teach that when the Messiah arrives, the festivals will cease to be observed, but Purim will continue to be observed. The Midrash derives this unusual, this is from the OU staff. 
Uh, the Midrash in Mishlei derives this unusual conclusion from a statement in the Gilat Esther 928. The memory of Purim will never cease from among their descendants. Why should a relatively minor festival be observed forever while the basic and more significant festivals will no longer be needed? Sort of like Sam's question. The following analogy will help explain this extraordinary puzzling, extraordinarily puzzling rabbinic teaching. Two individuals are given an assignment. Identify your friends in the black of night. One was supplied with a flashlight. He identified his friends by shining light in their faces. The second did not receive a flashlight. He was compelled to identify his friends by listening to their voices and the sound of their walk. The first did a far superior job. Seeing people's faces is far more effective than listening to their distant conversation or walk at night. But the second person developed a unique talent. By learning to train his ears and to listen attentively, he developed a special sensitivity born of his concentrated listening. When the sun rose in the morning, the first person extinguished his flashlight. What value is there to a small light in the glare of sunlight? The second individual, however, had developed the talent of recognized people even when he couldn't see them. He had acquired the ability to recognize people in the dark. This talent, which he developed and perfected during that long and dark night, reminded, remained with him during the next day and the next. During a leap year, there are two months of Adar in the Jewish calendar, Adar 1 and Adar 2. Usually, Halach insists that we observe the commandments at the earliest moment available, but Purim is an exception. Here, the law mandates that we celebrate Purim and read the Megillah of Esther on the second of Adar. Why? We want to make a point of the relationship between the redemption of Purim and the redemption from Egypt. That's what Rashi says. Just as the redemption from Egypt is dominated by the word Anohi, I am the Lord your God who took you out of the land of Egypt, the redemption of Purim is also dominated by the word Anohi. I am the Lord who will surely conceal. Anohi haster astir. The Talmud asks, how do we derive Esther from the Torah? What are the roots of Esther in the Torah? Despite the fact that Esther lived many generations later, the Talmud replies, in the Torah it says, Anohi haster astir. I'm the Lord who will surely conceal. I will hide. It is writ it's written with the same letters as Esther. What lesson do we derive from the two Anohis? That the Jewish people possess two methods by which to identify and recognize God. The first is the Anohi of Exodus. I'm the Lord your God. I performed public miracles when I brought you out of Egypt and gave you the Torah. This Anohi can be compared to the person who identified his friends by using a flashlight. There's a second way to recognize God, the ability of the Jewish people to recognize God, Anohi, I am, when he's concealed bespeaks of a unique talent, the ability to identify and understand the ongoing redemption of Hastir Aster, I will surely hide and conceal. The presence of God's hand in human events, even when it's not evident, perceived or obvious, is similar to the special talents of a person who trained his ears to recognize friends by, at night by listening to their voices and sounds. What conclusion does this lead us to? When the night of exile will be banished by the rising sun of the Messiah, when the presence of God, the Redeemer, all shine, will shine in all its strength and glory, this presence will be so glaring and obvious that we will no longer require the lights provided by our holidays to perceive the guiding hand of God in historical events. At that time, the light of godliness will be seven times more powerful than the light of the sun. And when the festivals with which the Jewish people felt the presence of God's guiding hand through great historical events will no longer be required. At that time, the holidays, all of which are rooted in the Exodus, will pale when exposed to the glare of the light of redemption. However, there is one exception. The special talent acquired by the Jewish people enabling them to recognize the hand of God's guiding providence when God's hand was concealed will remain their eternal possession even after the sun of the redemption will rise. At that time, all of the holidays will pale except for Purim, whose remembrance will never be forgotten. 
we see that there exist two types of light. The first is God is my light. And the second is though I sit in darkness, God is my light. The special quality of Purim is its ability to bring to fore the light which breaks through the darkness. Just as that unique light which guides man through darkness has a unique advantage, even surpassing the normal light of the sun, so too the pearls of knowledge which shine through the not knowing of the Adeloyada Purim are especially precious. Pesach is the holiday of spring, the first holiday of the first month of the year. As the plants break through the cold, barren earth, as the rays of spring warm the ground and cast away the cold, the heart is stirred by feelings of redemption. When a year has two Adars, Purim takes place at the end of the year. Purim is the last holiday and must occur on the last month of the year. All attempts to destroy the Jewish people will end with the banishment of the darkness of exile. The moment Purim departs, we prepare for the new year by studying the laws of Pesach. Our rabbis taught when Adar arrives, we begin to increase our joy. We rejoice in the knowledge that our enemies have been subdued while the exile is ended. Pesach is coming. It is a prelude to the great redemption, which will witness the rebirth and regeneration of the Jewish people as it rejoices in the arrival of the King Messiah. Now, many would suggest that what this is doing is showing that the Midrash is not to be taken literal. In other words, when, when, the, when the Midrash says that we will no longer observe the other holidays, we'll only observe Purim, it's not, it doesn't mean it literally. You will still have Passover. You will still have Shavuos. You will still have Sukkot. Um, because there are other places in the Torah that say that these laws are immutable, that they're not going to go away. They're not going to change. So, but what it means is that, like he was explaining, that this Midrash doesn't mean literally you're not going to celebrate Pesach, but that the lesson of Pesach will pale uh, now that Mashiach has come and we got to see um, you know, we got to see the redemption of Mashiach, um, the what our experience of Pesach oh, wow. is gonna sort of pale in comparison to it. Who is but this? Not who, who, so, who is yeah, so who wrote this? That was a good question. Because it just says OU staff. Oh, all right. But wait, maybe. Yeah. Maybe. Nothing. I push the mute. I want to tell the rabbi I'm having trouble with the phone. It's a message. We hear Are you. Are you there, Sam? We can hear you. <laughs> Sam, we hear you. Uh, it just says OU staff. I I don't know. That's that was I know, but that was so beautifully written. It's hard yeah, to believe it that that's OU staff. Rabbi, for what it's yeah. worth, I have an interpretation of why it's only Purim. Yeah. Because Purim embodies everything of Torah. It has the three things. You give to the poor, you love your neighbor through Mahana, and you study the Megillah. So, and, so where do you, the one thing I would I wonder about I there is, yeah. what about the Avoda section, the service? Al HaTorah Ba'al HaVoda V'al Gmilut Chasadim. So, I because the Torah part you could say uh, we have Kabbalah Satora, whatever you call that, okay. um, and you have Gmilut Chasadim taking care, you know, reaching out to others. But where where are you seeing the Avoda one, the service one? The service, um, well, unless it's the Megillah. Okay. But could we well, say the Megillah, the Megillah seems to be studying Torah to me, but okay. Right. right. But yeah. I have heard uh, the Gemara, it says, one of the answers in the Gemara for why there is not Hallel on Purim mm -hmm. is that the Megillah reading takes the place of Hallel. So if you it's say crazy. that the Megillah reading takes place of Hallel, oh. then that is a voda. Then that right. would be serious. Yes, nice. because it's so... Yeah. It's praise. Well, yeah. even though even though the name nice. isn't there, even though nice. the name isn't there, right. right, right. So they call it. They say that that is halal. So if that's halal, then that would be the avodah. So the Torah, you could say, either you could say the Torah is the study of the Megillah, or you could say Torah is Kabbalat Torah, because we we saw kimu ve kiblu, 
קימו מה שקיבלו כבר. It says they accepted upon themselves um, at the end of the Megillah, and the, the Talmud says they accepted that which they had previously accepted. In other words, there was a new Kabbalah Satorah, Kabbalah Satorah. So you could say that's the Torah part, then you have the Megillah functions as the Halal, as the Avodah, and then you have the Gemilas Hasanim. Or you could do it another way. But I like it, as always, you've done this now. I love Purim. Well, reliably. Those you are, are reliably my done two it. holidays, Pesach and Purim. Yeah. But I'll, I'll tell you, everybody else, another, because Estelle heard it, but the other the guys didn't hear it. Uh, Lois's other Chiddush, which was, uh, we were talking about the similarity between Yom Kippur and Purim. The Arizal says that Yom Kippurim, that Yom Kippur is a day like Purim, like Purim. And I was suggesting that these kind of teachings are pointing to something. They are not the teaching in itself, they are pointing to something that you have to look. So you'd want to look back and forth between Purim and Yom Kippur. So I was suggesting a couple of um, what, common themes. One of them is the lottery, the, 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 that on Yom Kippur, there's a lottery for the two goats and it's called the Goral. And uh, Purim is named after the lot that Haman, that Haman um, drew uh, to decide on what day to do the battle against the Jews. And it even says, he pil poor, he, he threw a lot, ha goral. That is the goral, the, the, um, that is a lottery, but it, it uses the word ha goral. Anyway, so you have that, which is a strong textual similarity between the two of them. Um, Where don't you, they talk about goral in in the you know for like goral as the sale? That's it. Yeah, Yom Kippur. That's it. The lottery on Yom Kippur. So that is oh. the the lot on Yom Kippur and the lot on Purim. Exactly. So then you have uh, I was suggesting you have a little bit deeper. You have Kabbalah Satora because at uh, at um, uh, in, in the Gemara on Shabbos, it, uh, it mentions that um, it, the, the verse says the Jews camped next to the mountain, but if you literally, it's they camped underneath the mountain, Tachti Sahar, underneath the mountain. So the Midrash says, God lifted the mountain over the people and said, either accept the Torah or you will be buried here. So um, the Gemara asks, if, if if we were coerced into accepting the Torah, why are we held responsible for not keeping it? It was coercion. So the Gemara is willing to willing to accept the question, but it says for sure after Purim, we are no longer coerced because on Purim, we accepted it out of, out of love. Kimu uh, kiblu So, uh, we fulfilled that which we accepted before, which means that this, it was almost like a second a marriage, you know, like a, a second wedding. It was like, uh, we, and, and at that point, we, we did it of our own volition. So I, I was, there's obviously much more to this over there, but I was just suggesting that this notion also applies to Yom Kippur, because if you follow the dates, the, the second tablets are brought down on Yom Kippur. The second tablets are brought down on Yom Kippur. And this is also like a second chance. They're both like second chances. So I was suggesting those two things. Then Lois brought up the notion that, um, that just like with um, the mountain hanging over their heads at Sinai, um, there is a, and you have the battle, you have the battle, um, at Ampurim, which is also like a, a threat, like a great threat to our existence. And also on Yom Kippur, the way we, we celebrate Yom Kippur in our liturgy, there is life and death hanging uh, as, we, as we are motivated to do our, uh, our, our work on Yom Kippur. So they all share that, you know, Purim and, and Yom Kippur share that as well, that there's like a, a threat, a hanging over 
uh, our sort of acceptance or, or, or motivating our repentance or our tshuva. And then Lois uh, brought up the idea that on Purim, you don't see God's hand in the Megillah. You, you just don't see God's hand in the Megillah. You, uh, uh, it looks like the um, success, the success comes because of the choices of people, the willingness of people to take action, the choices of people. So um, clearly, when you look in the commentaries uh, afterwards, they are strongly pointing out God behind the scenes, uh, even that the Megillah is, there are all different places in the Megillah that suggest that God is there, but it's not emphasizing God as a player. He's not moving. The, it doesn't emphasize him moving the events. Um, it emphasizes the people. So, and then, so I, when she said that, I was suggesting that this would also fit Yom Kippur because when it comes to Yom Kippur, obviously you want God's help, but we have to recognize that we're, we have to do the work. We, we at least have to begin the work. We may not be able to do the whole work, but, but you, you can't just toss up your hand and give up when it comes to being a better person or, or changing your ways or fixing something that you, fixing something that you, uh, that you broke. You can't just lift up your hands and say, what can I do? Let God take care of it. No, he expects us to do something. Like that. Anyway, so those were Lois's chidushim on, uh, on Purim. Okay, so uh, next one is, Number 35, that is that he commanded us that we have oil made according to a special recipe, ready, ready to anoint the high priest when he's appointed, as he said, the priest who is exalted above his fellows on whose head the anointing oil has been poured. Some of the kings were also anointed with it, as is explained in the laws of this commandment. And the tabernacle and all of its festivals have already been anointed by it. The vessels are not anointed for all generations. When new ones are made, for they said in the explanation in C3, that with the anointment of these, meaning the vessel of the tabernacle, all the future vessels were consecrated. So you consecrate the original vessels, but you don't need to keep on consecrating new vessels. So when some run out and you replace them, they don't need to be newly consecrated. The word um, for anointing is, is, um, is where the word Mashiach comes from. Mashuach uh, or Mashiach, he, th this is the uh, anointing. So when we call Mashiach Mashiach, we mean he's the anointed one. And uh, most specifically, what we mean is he is a descendant of David who was anointed by Shmuel. Shmuel in this week's Haftorah, which is from the book of Shmuel, when, he is, when Saul uh, does bad with Amalek, but he doesn't finish the job and Shmuel is coming to rebuke him. So, there's a, there's, at that point, Shmuel says, you know, you may not be that great in your own eyes, but you're king of Israel. You're, and you could have done this, basically, Shmuel is saying. You, you could have followed through, but you, you just have this thing. You don't think you're, you're great, and, or you don't think you're worthy or something. And, you, and it it's, uh, undermines you. But at, at the beginning, he said to him, I, I'm, the, I'm the anointer. When I anoint you, that means that you have the potential to be the Mashiach. When I anoint you, that's what Moshe Shapiro emphasized that. Nusra Sfard actually reads those two lines, those two extra lines. And in those two extra lines, he, makes the, he seems to be making this point. I'm the anointer. When I anoint you, you are, you are now capable of being Mashiach. You wouldn't be anointed if you weren't. So your low self-esteem, which has now undermined you, it's, your, it's in your head. It's not true. You had the potential, but you messed it up. Okay, so anyways, that's the, that word 
uh, anointing. That's what this is all about. Uh, this shall be anointing oil sacred to me throughout the ages, and the regulations of this commandment have already been explained in the first chapter of Kritut, also the Torah portion of Ki Tisa, which is next week's Torah portion. We are right on, on target with these Rambams. We are hitting them at all the right moments. The regulations of this commandment have already been explained in the first chapter of Krisus, also in Parshas Ki Tisa, Mishnah Torah, Vessel of the Sanctuary, and those who serve therein. So that is the special recipe, the making of the anointing oil. So that's what he's, is the mitzvah, not the anointing itself, but rather making the oil, he calls it having the oil. So it, the question Rabbi, is Rabbi, is that the vial is, that was found in the temple for Hanukkah? No. no? No, that was olive oil. This oh. oil, this oil is not here. Let's look at this oil as long as you said that. Let's just look at this oil and see if it goes right to it. Yes. Oh, you gotta love Safari. You just have to love it. All right. So uh so it says here you shall not you shall anoint Aaron and his sons consecrated to serve me as priests. So you should say to them, this shall be the anointed oil sacred to me throughout the ages. It must not be rubbed on any person's body. You must not make anything like it in the same proportions. It is sacred to be held sacred to you. Kodesh is the operative word there. Anybody who, and that word, uh, it means like um, to make perfume or or or, uh, or, yeah, something like perfume. And so anybody who makes this, uh, you know, mixes it like this or puts any of it on a person who is not supposed to have it put on will be cut off from his people. This is serious. So you have to take the, fi the following, um, and so it has stacked, Onica, galbanum, with frankincense, equal parts of each. And you make them into a kind, I guess, a powder, an incense, refined, pure and sacred. And then you beat some of it into powder, or there's the powder part, and put some before the pack of the tent of meeting where I'll meet you and it'll be most holy. Uh, all right, so how did we get to there? What happened to. Somehow he went to just the powder. Nataf is balsam because it is merely the sap which drips from the wood of the balsam tree, it is called nataf, dripping. In Old French, it's called gum. The bomb itself, however, is called theriac. And onaika, this is the root of a fragrant herb, smooth and transparent like the fingernail. In the language of the Mishnah, it's called tziporin. This is exactly how Unculus renders it. Uh, vitufra, which in Aramaic, it means nail. The chelmana, this is a malodorous, malodorous spice, which is called galbanum. Uh, okay. Samin means other spices also. From here, our rabbis learned there were 11 spices. Yeah, so the thing is, somehow we switched. We went from the anointing oil to, to the incense. at some point. But anyways, the anointing oil has lots of ingredients in it. <laughs> I was looking for some more clarity than that. But the anointing oil uh, has other ingredients in it. It is not just uh, olive oil.
Okay. All right. I'm very grateful to have this opportunity to learn with you guys. I look forward to learning with you in the future, but not tomorrow. Tomorrow. Okay. We will not learn tomorrow, but we, but, but Bezrat Hashem Wednesday. Yeah, Rabbi, thank you. Okay. Bye. All right. So have a wonderful Purim. Purim. Yes. Wonderful, wonderful Purim. Purim. Wonderful Purim. Okay. Yes. Thank you all, guys. Purim. A fly looking Purim. <laughs>